a salud. No, salud está en... ahí. Okay. Hey, Dan. How you doing? We're ready. We're we're ready for you. Buenos días, Colombia. Okay. I'm glad to hear those hymns. There were three of the three hymns I really loved. Well, we're going to be talking this morning about. Daniel chapter 9. So if you have your Bibles open to Daniel chapter 9, we're going to be talking about it in three groups. I love to use the word, the, the, the divisions of three, as you know. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about Daniel's discovery, Daniel's intercessory prayer, and then Daniel's 70 weeks. And I really appreciate all your prayers for us here in Colombia. Last week I was a little sick, but I'm fine now. And I have a built-in nurse here, you know. Uh, Monica takes real good care of me and she's got me nursed back to health and a voice again. So God willing, we're gonna be able to do this message this morning with the help of my good son-in-law mark <laughs> so here we go mark we're going to start with daniel chapter 9 and the first two verses daniel's discovery all right here we go daniel chapter 9 verses 1 and 2. in the first year of darius the son of Assyrus, ah of the lineage of the medes who was made king over the realm of the chaldeans in the first year of his reign i daniel understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through, through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Now we're not sure how Daniel discovered that, but I believe that Daniel discovered it by the, by the, the words that Jeremiah sent to the exiles in Jerusalem. In Daniel, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 25, Daniel speaks to the people that they better submit to Nebuchadnezzar if they want to survive. <laughs> and then in Daniel chapter uh, 29, after the year, uh, after the, they were taken to captivity, then uh, Jeremiah also reminds them of the 70 years that they're going to spend in in, in Babylon. So let's read those verses. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 12. Mark. Jeremiah 25, 12. Then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. After they were taken to Babylon, they were going to be there 70 years. But after the 70 years, God was going to also punish Nebuchadnezzar, which he did by destroying Babylon. Okay, and then chapter 29, Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 10 is it? Jeremiah 29, 10, where thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. So that was the great discovery that Daniel made. Now, Daniel had been in Babylon for many years. He was taken there captive as a young man, but he rose to be like the prime minister of the whole realm of the Chaldeans of Babylon. He was a very, very important dignitary under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar and then Nebuchadnezzar's sons and grandson. And so Daniel had discovered these books of Jeremiah and he discovered the prophecy that Israel was going to be taken captive and they were going to be there and that they were going to be uh, 
eventually uh, rescued and taken back into their land. Well, there, the prophecy had been an old prophecy in the book of Leviticus. And God had told Moses that if Israel left the worship of the true God and began to serve other gods, they would be taken away from their land for a long period of time. So let's read those verses in Leviticus chapter 25, the first few verses of Leviticus chapter 25, where God had, God had told Moses hundreds of years before what would happen if they departed from the living God. Leviticus 25, 1 through 6, you want me to read? Yeah. All right. And the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the, for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall ne neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. What grows of its own accord of your harvest you shall not reap, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine, for it is year of rest for the land. And the Sabbath produce of the land shall be food for you, for you, your male and female servants, your hired man, and the stranger who dwells with you. So you remember in the creation, the Lord created the world and, and everything in six days, and then he rested the seventh day. And now with regard to the land, he told Moses that once they got into the land, they were to allow the land to be, be tilled and reaped and worked for seven years, but the seventh year was supposed to be a Sabbath of rest for the land. And if they didn't do that, then they would be taken out of the land. And so in Leviticus chapter 26, the next chapter, we're told something very interesting about this Sabbath rest of the land of Israel. Want to read those verses, Mark, please? From Leviticus chapter 26. Okay, Leviticus 26, 34 and 35, and then 43. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbath as long as it lies desolate, and you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbath. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest. For the time it did not rest on your Sabbath when you dwelt in it. And then 43. The land also shall be left empty by them and will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. They will accept their guilt because they despise my judgments and because their, their soul abhorred my statutes. Yeah, so that was a prophecy made a thousand years before Daniel ever lived. And it was the basis of the captivity in Babylon and then of the restoration and the time of 70 weeks, prophetic weeks that were going to take place after they returned from, Israel, from Babylon until the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, the word of God to Daniel became a very living word. It began to mobilize his life energize his life with the hope that his people would be one day taken back. And because they were at that very place at, after 70 years of captivity in the land of Babylon, they would soon be taken back. And that the word of God will be, would be a living word to Daniel. And he would really be excited by it and begin to Pray that God would fulfill his word. Now, I'd just like to tell you a little story that I was remind, reminded of by this history. And that is a little story of how the word of God is so such a comfort and such a challenge to us as it was to Daniel. In the 1960s, John F. Kennedy 
founded the Alliance for Peace and prepared to send teams of technicians to third world countries. It was called the Peace Program. And, to, and so there was a team that was sent to Colombia and one man was sent to Bogota to work. They were prepared in education. They were prepared in farming. They were prepared in engineering to teach people of third world countries like Colombia better methods to improve their lives. And while he was working with a team in Bogota, he fell in love with a girl from Bogota. <laughs> and he eventually married her. And then when his two years were finished in Colombia, he took her back to uh, West Palm Beach with him. Now in West Palm Beach, we had a very lively assembly. It was a large assembly. And uh, uh, Rip Van Vian was one of the workers there. And uh, this girl got a job teaching Spanish in a little school in West Palm Beach. And there she met a, one of the believers from the assembly who befriended her and invited her to some Bible studies they had for the girls uh, in West Palm Beach. And so she accepted the invitation and she went to the Bible studies and eventually get, she got saved. <laughs> well, she was so joyful about her salvation. And, and after one day of teaching at school and then the Bible class, uh, she went home and and then when, when her husband came home, she told him about, uh, uh, about her newfound faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, he wasn't very happy about it. And a little while after that, when she came home, she opened the door to find out that the apartment was completely empty of all its furniture, and all of her personal belongings at, as well. The only thing that he left her was a Band-Aid, probably making fun of her. Well, of course, she was devastated. She could hardly believe it. The only thing she had was her Bible that she brought home with her. And she took that Bible out to the beach because they lived close to the beach. She took her Bible out to the beach and after a time of prayer, she opened her Bible and she could hardly believe her eyes. She could hardly believe how the Bible, how the Lord was speaking to her own situation, to her own heart. She opened her Bible to Isaiah Chapter 54, a wonderful chapter. We're only going to read verse 4, 5, and 6. But this is the part of the chapter that her eyes fell upon and comfort her and challenge the heart. I'm going to read those verses for us, Mark. Isaiah chapter 54, verses 4 to 6. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. Neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you, you, when you were refused, says your God. Thank you. What a wonderful passage. The whole chapter is so wonderful. You can read it at your leisure. But she was so challenged by that passage and so comforted that God had not left her alone. Eventually, she returned to Bogota to her homeland and began life all over again with the Savior as her Lord and her God and her guide. What a wonderful illustration, what a discovery that that woman made, a discovery that changed her life, a discovery that empowered her to go on living for the Lord. Just as Daniel made that great discovery, 
that his people will one day, after 70 years captivity in the land of Babylon, would be rescued and they would be returned to their own land. So now let's begin the second part of the message, which is Daniel's intercession, intercession for his people, his intercessory prayer. It's a long passage from Daniel chapter 3 to verse 19. We're not going to read the whole chapter, but do you read a few verses, Mark, uh, in this prayer of Daniel from, from chapter, from verse 3? probably to verse six. All right. Um, then I, Daniel, set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and, I, and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy for those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity <clears throat> and have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes and to, all, to our fathers and all, and, all the land of the, and all the people of the land. Yes, the prayer, the, the prayer goes on and on, confessing the transgressions, the iniquities, the sin of the people of Israel, of the nation, and pleading for God to show his mercy and to fulfill that discovery that Daniel made to fulfill his word that after the 70 years of captivity in Babylon, they would indeed be freed and they would once again be returned to their land. Well, Daniel's prayer for God to work reminded me of the experience that Joan and I had in the Bahamas during our three years of serving him there on the island of Long Island. God called us there. We had visited the Bahamas while we were still at Emmaus Bible School. We had gone on a summer team in 1952. I with a group of men and she with a group of women and serving on separate islands for the summer. I served there for uh, two months with Heskis Johnson, who was a missionary from Erie, Pennsylvania, who was working in the Bahamas and had an interest in uh, the work of the Lord in the Bahamas. Well, we returned to Emmaus for a couple more years and in the end of 1954, uh, uh, Joan and I were engaged to be married. And then I went to the Bahamas for a whole year. <laughs> while Joan did a nursing course in Toronto, Canada, and worked in, the, in that island for 13 months, at the end of which I returned, we were married, and we served the Lord for three more years in, in the Bahamas on Long Island. We were very happy there. We saw people saved, and we lived in a little settlement called Lower Deadman's Key or Lower Deadman's Island <laughs> on the island of Long Island. And uh, we were very happy. We saw the Lord work in a number of different places, but we did not see anybody saved in the settlement where we lived. We had a children's meeting every Friday afternoon after school, and the kids would come and we'd have, give them little tracks and papers to send home to their parents. And yet nobody got saved. Well, we talked about it and gradually we were interested in serving the Lord among people were, who didn't have their Bible. We heard about the five missionaries who were killed in Ecuador on January the 8th in 1956. And, uh, trying to reach a tribe of Indians, the Alcas, who did not have the Bible in their own language. And we gradually became burdened for people who do not have the Bible in their own language. And so we prayed about it and God burdened, for, burdened our hearts that we might serve him among 
some tribe of people who as yet did not have the Bible. But we did not want to leave the Bahamas. We were very happy there. We saw God's blessing. But we didn't see anybody saved in the settlement where we lived. So we were reminded of that verse in Malachi, I believe, where God said, prove me now, saith the Lord, prove me now, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall be not room enough to receive it. So we agreed that we were going to ask the Lord to give us 12 souls from the area where we lived. After a gospel campaign of one month. So we started to preach this word of God from the book of Matthew every night for one month, one chapter at a time. And people came and began to fill our little gospel room there. And one of the most important people that uh, in the whole settlement was a man who would read the homily for the local priest of the Anglican church. And his kids had been coming to our children's meetings and taking home our little tracts and pamphlets. And he began to come with his wife and his whole family sat in the first few rows. rows. And during that gospel campaign of a whole month, we preached the gospel and gave an invitation to receive the Lord every night after the message. And for three weeks, nobody got saved. <laughs> well, we had one week left. And as we were considering that last week, I was reading in Matthew chapter 14. In Matthew chapter 14, where the Lord came to his disciples on the fourth watch of the night. I want to read that passage for us, Mark. In Matthew chapter 14, I think it's, what verse does it start with? 22? Yeah. yeah. Um, that's the parable about the who so uh, the, the king. What's that? Matthew chapter fourteen, where the Lord was walking on the water at night, and he approached the disciples' boat, and it was the fourth. I got, I got it. I got it. I was in the wrong chapter. All right. Immediately, Jesus, this is Matthew 14, 22. <clears throat> Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Well, he sent his multitudes away, <clears throat> or sent the multitudes away. And when he had seen the multitudes, when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Want me to keep going? Want me to keep yeah, going? Uh, the Lord can work even at the last moment. <laughs> The fourth watch of the night. Well, we were we were in the fourth watch of the campaign. We were in the fourth week of the gospel campaign. And during that week, we had asked for 12 souls during that month of meetings. And during that week, 25 people came to the Lord. <laughs> that man who was the reader of the Anglican Church and his family came to the Lord and many others. And as the prophet said, the Lord poured out a blessing that there was hardly room enough to contain it. And we took that as a sign that we should prepare to leave the Bahamas, leave those believers in the care of another brother who was working with us. And they began to form a large assembly there on that part of the island. And it's still going on today. There's still an assembly there to the glory of God 
and it had Dunman's Key in Long Island. <laughs> well, God answered that prayer and God led us back to the United States to begin studying to prepare to work with people who do not yet have an alphabet in their language, they do not have a written uh, form of their, their language, and they do, did not, of course, have the Bible in their, in, their, in their tongue. And eventually God led us to Columbia. And in 1963, on the 2nd of February, we landed in Bogota, Colombia, and the next day started to study Spanish and then began to work with an Indian tribe the next year where we were able to begin to learn their language and study the scriptures, translate the scriptures into their tongue. So the word of God is living, it's powerful, and it's able to answer, he is able to answer our prayers according to his purpose, according to his direction, according to his plan for people who do not have the word of God in their own language. So let's go now to the last part of the prophecy of the 70 weeks, beginning from Daniel chapter 9 and starting to read from verse 20. Please, Mark. Want me to read right through to the end of the chapter, the whole prophecy? Just, just the introduction. Okay. Uh, Daniel, Daniel 9, 20 through 23. Now, while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God, before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. So this is the introduction to the, to the prophecy, which is known as the key to biblical prophecy or the backbone to Israel, to, to biblical prophecy. The last part of this section, the last four verses, is the revelation that the angel Gabriel gave to Daniel. And Daniel, because he had such a heart for the people of God and was so obedient to God, the angel Gabriel called him as a man greatly beloved. Oh, what a title, right? <laughs> what a nickname. What a title to be called a man greatly beloved by God. There were other men too in the Bible. As you remember, there was Abraham. He earned the title of the friend of God. <laughs> and there's three verses in the Old Testament and the book of James too that remind us that Abraham was called the friend of God three times. And then there was the, then there was the apostle, the disciple John. John called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. How many times? Five times in the book of John. John called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. Wow, what a designation, what a privilege to consider oneself as being loved by God. And then the Lord Jesus Christ himself on the way to Gethsemane, he said, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. 
And so Jesus said, no longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends. Because all things that my father has revealed to me, I have shared with you, I've made known to you. And of course, we are all the friends of God. God is designed to call us his friend. What a wonderful thing to be a friend of God, not an enemy. We were enemies before. We were weak and sinful and enemies of God. But now because of, of the sacrifice of Christ, we have been made the friends of God. Well, let's go on to the next verse there, Mark, in Daniel chapter 9. Okay, you want me to read 24 through 27? Yeah, no, just 24. 24, okay. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Okay, thanks. That's a great verse. This is the beginning of the revelation that there would be 70 weeks, 70 weeks of years, not of days, 70 weeks of years. And the whole plan of God would be completed in those 70 weeks. Those six things that the angel Gabriel tells Daniel, the first three things were accomplished through the cross in the time of Jesus. And the last three things would be completed at the end of Christ's reign of a thousand years. But he begins by saying that 70 weeks are determined upon the people of God. Now the term 70 weeks, the term weeks was familiar to the Jewish people. And as has been said many times, the word of God interprets itself. It explains itself what it means by certain things. And the, where the term weeks for years, for a week of years, is perfectly illustrated and explained by the experience of Jacob when he traveled from his homeland because of the threat of Esau to kill him. And he traveled more than 500 miles way back to Mesopotamia and Haran where, where Abraham lived before for a while until his father died. And when Jacob approached the time, approached the land, this is the story that we're told in Genesis chapter 29. So you want to read that story for us, Mark, chapter 29 of Genesis, beginning at verse... where Jacob is approaching the land of Haran, and he finds out. So, Genesis, Genesis 29, verse 1. So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and saw a well in the field, and behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they would roll the sto stone from the well's mouth, water and sheep, and put the stone back in place on the well's mouth. And Jacob said to them, My brethren, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. Then he said to them, Do you, not, do you, not, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And so he said to them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Then he said, look, it is still high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. Is that where you wanted me to read? <laughs> Keep going, okay. Now, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep for she was a sh shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled a stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban. 
Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father. Then it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with them for a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The, the name of the elder was Leah, and the name of, of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve your, you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled that I may go into her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. And Laban gave his maid Zilpha to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, It must not be done so in your country to give the younger, oh, I'm sorry, in our country, to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week, and we will give you this one for also for, your, for the service which you will serve with me still another seven years. Then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, so he gave him his daughter Rachel as wife also. And Laban gave his maid Billa to his daughter Rachel as a maid. So then Jacob, you all set? Okay. So, so that's the story of how the, the phrase a week, representing a week of years, was, was made a phrase popular, well-known in Israel. And so when the prophecy about the weeks of years in Daniel meant that the 70 weeks would represent 70 weeks of seven years or 490 years. And that was a period of time that was gonna pass when God would fulfill his promises to Israel, not only just returning them to their land, but beginning to restore the city of Jerusalem through Ezra and Nehemiah, and then right up through to the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. So please read the next verse there, Mark, in the Daniel chapter 9. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Now therefore, oh, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be 70 weeks and, and 62 weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. So this is the period of time from the restoration of Israel uh, until the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, the angel Gabriel divides the period of time into three parts. The first section of seven weeks or 49 years, the second period of 62 weeks or 434 years, and then the 70th week of seven years. And that's basically the outline of the prophecy that the angel Gabriel told the people, told Daniel that would happen um, to his people. The people would return to the land and they would go through a time of seven prophetic weeks or 49 years. Now this may be a time of the redemption of the land. There's a verse in Leviticus chapter 25 and verse eight that tells us that Jewish people who had to maybe sell their land for a time 
could redeem it after a time. That's the story of the book of Ruth, isn't it, in the Bible? And this verse in Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 8, we'll just read verse 8, Mark, to show that the first 49 years back in the land may have referred to a time of redemption of the land when the next year would be the year of Jubilee, when they would rejoice at being back in their land. So what does Leviticus chapter 25, verse 8 say, Mark? And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourselves, seven times seven years. And the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you 49 years. Very interesting, right? Well, that's not mentioned in Daniel chapter 9, but I believe that that's why it's mentioned seven weeks of years when the people were re returning to their land and many of them were redeeming their land. The next period of land, the next period of time was a group of 62 weeks. 62 weeks were 434 years, weeks of years. And during that time, the Jewish people and the world at that time was subjugated by the Medes and Persians that defeated Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus freed the Jews to go back to their land, as we're told in the end of Second Chronicles chapter 36 and Ezra chapter 1, where the people were, or, were liberated from their captivity by Cyrus the Great, and they were allowed to go back to their land. And then, of course, later on, Alexander the Great was raised up to defeat the Persians, and then the Romans came upon the scene and defeated the Greeks, and then they began their rule, during which time the Lord Jesus was born, and it was the beginning of the Roman Empire. But at the end of those 62 weeks, what is it that we are told? What is the next phrase, Mark? Well, uh, the street shall be built again in the wall. Is that what you're, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Okay. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall, shall be with a flood, and until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Yeah, it begins with that terrible phrase. At the end of those 62 weeks, 60, 60, 62 week period, Messiah shall be cut off. What a terrible phrase describing the rejection and the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. The same phrase is found in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. What a terrible prophecy. The Lord was cut off. You know, as I heard read those two phrases that the Messiah, Messiah was cut off, not for himself. He was cut off for his people's sins. And I was reminded of uh, an old song that they used to sing about my grandfather's clock. Some of you might remember that song. It goes like this. My grandfather's clock was too large for the show. So it stood 90 years on the floor. It was taller by half than the old man himself, yet it weighed not a penny weight more. It was bought on the morn of the day that he was born and was always his treasure and pride. But it stopped short never to go again when the old man died. Ninety years without slumbering, tick-tock, 
tick tock is life. Seconds numbering tick tock, tick tock, but it stopped short, never to go again when the old man died. <laughs> oh, there's a great history about that clock. When the Lord Jesus Christ died, the prophetic clock of 69 years stopped short. It stopped short, but it didn't stop never to go again. It stopped short to begin a day of grace of over 2,000 years when the prophetic clock was silent. And during these 2,000 years, the Spirit of God is forming a new creation, a creation of the children of God creating the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ that will someday be complete. And then his people, we will be taken out of this world, the living and the dead, changed forever, transformed forever, and taken into the very presence of God. And then after that time of grace, this day of grace, the prophetic clock will stop, start ticking again. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall be raised and the living will be changed, the prophetic clock will start ticking again. It will start ticking off the last seven years of the 70th work of this prophecy that was given to Daniel. And that 70th week will be characterized by the rule of the Antichrist. He will control the economic and military strength of the world. He will make a covenant with Israel for seven years, it says. And in the midst of that, that time when there will be apparent peace and prosperity under the rule of the Antichrist. But in the middle of that week, it says, at the end of three and a half years, 1,260 days and 62 months, those three designations are applied to it. Then the Antichrist will break his promise with Israel. He, would put his, he will put his own image in the temple and demand that the Jewish people honor and worship him as their God. That was the old desire of Satan years ago when he, as the angel guardian of the throne of God, rebelled against God and wanted to be higher than the throne of God and replace God as God. And at the end of those, at the end of those seven years, the Lord Jesus Christ will come and he will establish his reign upon the earth. And Satan, the false prophet, and the false prophet of Israel, and the, 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 the false messiah, and the beast will be all overcome and Christ will begin his thousand year reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that 70th week will end with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in glory with all of us. And the prophecy of Revelation chapter 19 will be fulfilled and Christ will overcome his enemies and initiate his rule of a thousand years. What a wonderful prophecy this is of Daniel chapter nine. And what a wonderful comfort it is for ourselves as we look forward to the day when our Lord Jesus Christ will come again. And to know that Mark and others of you will continue this series of, of prophet prophetic teaching about the rapture, about the time of Daniel's rest restoration of the 70, 70 weeks and 
God will be glorified and you will be comforted and challenged. And you will also know the wonderful promise of the Lord Jesus Christ coming for us and to take us to be with himself. God bless you all. Thank you for allowing me to uh, share these thoughts with you about Daniel chapter 9. It's been a great blessing to me uh, remembering these uh, personal illustrations of God's dealing with us, discovering his plan for our lives, fulfilling his intercessory prayer for his people, and then giving us the hope, the blessed hope of his second coming when we will rule and reign with him for those thousand years and when the prophetic plan of God will be terminated and fulfilled and there will be peace and there will be ju justice and there will be righteousness to all the earth. God bless you all and God keep you. Thank you, Lord, for this time together with your people at Cornerstone. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. And thank you, Father, that you have fulfilled your promises with Israel, and you will fulfill your promises, too, for the church of our Lord Jesus Christ in taking us into your presence when you come to raise the dead and change the living and glorify him in the earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you, Lord, and bless your people, I pray, in his worthy name. Amen. Sunday dinner. <laughs>